Um, good afternoon, all participants of this uh, workshop, the webinar with the title Unlocking the Flexible Packaging Dilemma. My name is Chris Brownes. I'm the Managing Director of KIDV, the Dutch Netherlands Institute for Sustainable Packaging. And uh, I welcome you all. We have already 150 participants actual online, and we have 450 interested people who, are, who will attend this meeting this afternoon. Um, from, of course, the Netherlands for a big part, but also from UK, Germany, Belgium, India, Indonesia, Finland, Ukraine, Sweden, Norway, and other countries. So it's a very international afternoon. And uh, that means that the, the subject we are dealing with this afternoon is, uh, well, I think, uh, an, an international uh, issue on flexible packaging. We have a, a great lineup today. We have Graham Holder from CFLEX, Gijs Langerveld from KIDV, Dominika Maruchak from PepsiCo, and Tor Thomas from Unilever, and an expert panel afterwards, after the pause. We have uh, Jaco Twicht of the Dutch Waste Fund, Anod Passenier of the Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management, Jelme Fiestra from Nature and Milieu is NGO, and Dana Malsova from CFLEX having the discussions as the presentations. And um, uh, may I take the opportunity to introduce our uh, uh, strategy or our, let's say, uh, uh, Bible of, of, of KIDV, which is called State of Sustainable Packaging. Uh, for those who haven't uh, seen it yet, you can you can look at the website that this publication is still available and downloadable uh, for free, or you can order also the book itself. It's um, it's a book with uh, with a lot of uh, strategic notions and, uh, and considerations for the next coming years on all kinds of packaging materials. Flexible packaging is, of course, one of the hot topics and very complex issues. We will discuss this later. And uh, our, let's say, general approach in this, in this uh, state of sustainable packaging is we see three types of in innovation tracks. The first track is on the recycling side, which is obviously also um, a main topic today. The innovation track two is how can we increase circularity with that, uh, which is also uh, uh, close to the, 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 the well, the issues we are we are talking today because you want, of course, when you make recyclate, you want also have this uh, at high end uh, new products. And innovation track two is a dream for the future. Merely also for the flexibles, it's a dream for the future. But we have to think about intrinsic sustainability in types of packaging. That means that we uh, want to have packaging materials which are what we call uh, 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 comparable with the environment. So they can feed in, and uh, we want to avoid the waste of that. Um, well, this is uh, we will have a lot of uh, interesting talks, um, and uh, I did mention the, the, our chair until now. This is uh, Tim Sykes. I'm very happy that he will uh, uh, lead and chair this meeting this afternoon. Uh, Tim Sykes is brand director at Packaging Europe, the leading European media resource for and about the packaging industry. He has a wide interest uh, around the demands driving packaging strategies and innovations, in particular its impact on the environment. And Tim is the founder and organizer of the Sustainability Awards, the leading global competition focused on sustainable packaging innovation and of the Sustainable Packaging Summit. And I also looked at his uh, LinkedIn profile and he's also excellent uh, a Russian speaker, although uh, I think Tim, Russian is not needed today. And we are happy to have you as a native speaker, as a chair. And uh, I will happily give you the floor and wish you a lot of success in this afternoon, uh, the sessions and discussions. And uh, well, go ahead, the floor is yours, Tim. Thank you. Thanks very much for that introduction, Chris. I, I, I guess the Russian is, is not going to be very relevant today. Is it? Um, welcome, everyone. And, and also welcome on behalf of the, the Netherlands Institute of Sustainable Packaging, KIDV, and the KIDV Community of uh, Practice Flexibles. Um, it's a real pleasure to be part of today's event, um, exploring this topic of unlocking the flexible packaging dilemma. Um, I understand we have, as uh, Chris just mentioned, 450 registrants for today's session, and that really underlines the importance of this topic uh, to industry and, and the wider world. 
Um, indeed, as someone whose day job re revolves around covering sustainability across packaging, I have to say that circular economy in flexible packaging in particular strikes me as really one of the top priority uh, questions for packaged goods and FMCG. Um, and over the last two or three years in particular, it's been one of the most impressive areas of, of progress across, uh, across packaging to, to witness. Europe has been at the forefront of this project to build a circular economy for flexibles. And within Europe, initiatives and collaborations in the Netherlands in particular are really at the cutting edge of pioneering this implementation and exploring the, the solutions to the, the various practical challenges that arise from these, these huge goals that we face. So as, as Chris has already, already said, um, although we have a Dutch focus in today's panel, it really is uh, a, di a discussion today of truly international significance. Um, and yeah, that's that's why we're conducting it in English today and why I have uh, have the honor of moderating today's session. Um, obviously, I must apologize in advance for mispronunciation of Dutch names, which uh, can obviously cause challenges for uh, English native speakers. As Chris mentioned, we have uh, two parts in today's session uh, with, first of all, uh, presentations from uh, the speakers that Chris has already mentioned, so I won't uh, go over the names again. Um, and after a short break of five minutes to recharge our batteries, we'll have a, a panel discussion uh, delving deeper into some of the, the challenges that uh, we face and that perhaps are going to be um, talked about in, in the initial uh, presentations. Over the course of these discussions, we really want to focus on practical questions. What are the next steps, the next challenges, the dilemmas and the unresolved issues that we face? We don't want to um, congratulate ourselves on what we've we've done, even though you know a great deal of impressive progress has been made. So we're going to focus on, on these practical, useful questions for uh, the, the near future. Um, one other remark I'd like to make before we begin is that we really want to make you, the audience, um, have as much opportunity as poss possible to engage with today's discussion and indeed to shape it. So in part one, after each presentation, we'll have time to put your questions to the speakers. Um, you can share those questions through uh, the chat in the, the app that you're engaging with at the moment. So don't be shy, share your questions. In the likely events that we don't have time to answer every single question, please feel free to contact KIDV after the webinar and they will try to get back to you with, with helpful answers. In part two, uh, during the panel discussion, we'll be inviting you also to engage, uh, this time by asking for your own views. Um, at certain times, you will see polls popping up on your screen and we'll be very interested to see how much the hive mind of our audience today agrees with uh, the views of our speakers. So uh, that's enough of me introducing. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to the first of our uh, presentations, uh, which is from uh, Graham Holder, who's project coordinator and managing director of CFLEX. Good, I think my microphone is now on. Yes, it certainly is, yeah. It takes there's a bit of a delay there for the other speakers when they uh, switch their microphones on so thank you very much tim and uh, thank you very much uh, kidv for uh, uh inviting me to participate in this uh, on this call um is somebody going to put the slides up uh um i will uh, continue um there they are uh so it's my my honor to uh, uh be the project coordinator for cflex it's a, uh, for those of you who don't know it, uh, our job uh, is to deliver what we call mission circular. And uh, mission circular for flexible packaging means you have to collect it, all of it. Uh, we want to get at least 80% of the materials that uh, uh, come back from the market uh, going into a recycling process so that they get converted and returned to the economy where they are actually used to replace virgin materials in end markets that can use them sustainably. This means with a reduced environmental impact and with a, uh, at, a at a cost which is affordable to them, uh, i.e. competitive with virgin. Um, CFLEX has, has grown dramatically over the four years that we've been around. 
Um, and uh, I don't know what happened to the slides. I can't see them anymore. But uh, uh, the uh, we we started that in 2017 with about 30 uh, uh, stakeholders, and today we're 180. But I think what's most important is that we have representatives from all parts of the value chain, from the material producers through to what we call the flexible packaging ecosystem, which includes extended producer responsibility schemes, TNO, uh, machine manufacturers, and, and everybody in between. And the reason why I think uh, we've grown to such a uh, an impressive number of participants is because everybody's realized that they can't do this by themselves. It costs too much. And also we need to move and lockstep uh, as we try and deliver this circular economy for flexible packaging. And the first thing that CFLEX has set out to do is to, is to envision what this flexible packaging looks like uh, so that everybody is going in the same direction and we're making good progress. So uh, 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 we have, uh, sorry, clicks, it's a bit slow. Uh, so earlier this or late middle of last year, we brought out uh, our design guidelines. And this was the result of over 100 companies uh, in CFLEX participating and saying, well, what makes flexible packaging recyclable? And we've captured that knowledge uh, in our design guidelines. Uh, and uh, it's been downloaded over 2000 times already in the last six months. Um, but we would encourage everybody to, uh, uh, to look at these and to understand what impacts uh, the recyclability of flexible packaging and what you can do to make it more recyclable. And that's really what we're, what we're here today. I mean, this is the first part of the puzzle. How do I make my flexible packaging more sustainable? The, uh, the second part of the puzzle is, well, what does the circular economy for flexible packaging look like? And we've de developed this slide, uh, which we call our roadmap. Uh, which says, well, firstly, you've got to collect it. Secondly, for the, the monomaterial fractions out there, and the monomaterials makes up a big proportion of flexible packaging, somewhere between uh, 60 and uh, high 70%, uh, and has the potential to be even higher if we redesign them. So we need to sort and recycle that fraction because, yeah, it's, it's monomaterials. Can be done, is being done. Uh, step three is about redesigning those materials which are multi-material, but which could actually be uh, made monomaterial without impacting their, uh, uh, their performance. The fourth step is about finding, uh, recognizing that there will be, still be some uh, materials out there which need to be multi-material because they have functionality which you can't deliver with a monomaterial solution. And, uh, uh, and we have to find solutions to recycle those ones as well. And then perhaps the most important step is that we have to have end markets uh, for all of these materials. It's pointless recycling them if they sit in a warehouse somewhere gathering dust. They, they need to be an attractive uh, material for those end markets willing to use them. And that attractiveness is with the uh, uh, relative to uh, uh, virgin materials. So we've taken that roadmap and boiled it down to three steps of an, uh, in, in the enablers. One is about design. Uh, it's got to be designed to be recycled. And uh, we have the, the uh, CFLEX guidelines designed for a circular economy. Uh, and we see those as being instrumental in, uh, uh, in, uh, in echo-modulating uh, the EPR fees related to the packaging that you put onto the market uh, so that we encourage, uh, economically encourage, uh, them to be increasingly recyclable. And if they not, can't be increasingly recyclable, that they pay their way. Uh, and uh, don't disrupt. The second part is about infrastructure. Um, we need the, uh, the infrastructure in place to collect it, sort it and recycle it, uh, and um, back to a quality where in markets are willing to use it. Now, there's a very good reason why we don't currently collect, sort and recycle uh, all flexible packaging today. The, the, the reason for that is that if we did, there would be a lot of people going out of business because EPR systems uh, fund the collection, sorting and recycle uh, of these materials up to the point where they meet the targets. Now, in a circular economy, you don't have targets. Everything has to be uh, collected, sorted and recycled. 
So this is why the, where the third part comes in, which is about making sure that there's a sustainable business case for all parts of the chain uh, to be able to use these materials. And that's where EPR comes in, because EPR, it enables today's meeting of the targets, but it also is, is able to uh, enable us to go circular and to make sure that the materials that we collect, sort and recycle uh, pay their own way, but also are economically attractive uh, relative to Virgin. So uh, if I uh, spring forward, just to emphasize the uh, importance of EPR, this is a, a, a visual of what we think EPR looks like. Uh, and I can't see the slides anymore, but uh, they, they seem to have gone. Uh, and, uh, um, uh, and this is what we think it needs to develop to. Sorry, I think I've gone one step too far. There we go. Uh, we, we see EPR as being the glue that helps the, uh, uh, the different parts of uh, the, the flexible packaging value chain uh, go circular. It incorporates its design, incorporates collection, sorting, recycling, and it also facilitates end markets. And uh, they're going to have a much more important role in the future. Uh, and I think some of those discussions will come out hopefully in the in the, in the coming presentations. So I hope that uh, uh, gets this uh, event off to a, a a good start. It is a very holistic picture that we're trying to build build here, and I'm looking forward to uh, hearing what uh, what is presented. Thank you very much. As as we said, uh, we'd like to audience questions to you as much as possible. Um, so uh, we, we've had a few questions uh, coming to you regarding CFLEX. Um, first of all, um, we've had a couple of questions actually talking about the um, interrelationship between CFLEX and Recycle Us. Um, so one asking about um, uh, whether the uh, design for recycling guidelines are aligned with uh, PRE Recycle Us um, and another uh, talking about uh, any differences or distinctions? We uh, are very conscious that there are some minor but important differences between our different sets of guidelines. They are set up to do different things. Um, uh, Recyclox guidelines are, uh, are focusing towards the circular economy, but based on what's needed today. CFLEX guidelines are, are designed on, on, on what we need to get all those materials back. So it's not only film to film, but we're talking about material circularity. We acknowledge that uh, the uh, aspirations set in the recyclos guidelines are, uh, uh, are, are necessary if you want to go back to film. But we do have to recycle all the materials uh, in the circular economy, and we do have to find solutions to be able to do that economically. So uh, uh, we are we have a brief out with the uh, PRE and Recyclos to say, how do we get alignment uh, uh, between these these different purposes that we're uh, uh, we're currently having, um, we will get there. It's going to take us some time because there's some uh, some fundamental differences in the approach uh, and and purpose of the, the of the two 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 sets of guidelines. But we'll get there, and uh, yeah, I'm confident. Okay, thank you. Um, we've we've had several questions uh, about EPR systems in general. Um, I rather than trying to talked about all of them. Um, I wonder if we could sort of generalize all of those questions and, and just ask for your overview of where you see the, the pressure points and, and you know what would be on your wish list, what's in most imperfect and top of your agenda at the moment in terms of making that more, uh, more effective. We, um, at, at EPR is uh, the elephant in the room. Uh, it's not being spoken about in nearly as much detail, and yet it is the key piece of the circular economy puzzle uh, which we need to tackle. It is it provides the framework for this whole thing to operate. Uh, in CFLEX, we've uh, we've developed with the help of a, a number of big brand owners uh, what we call criteria for circularity. And this tries to outline the changes that we see that will be necessary in an EPR uh, scheme, all EPR schemes to be able to allow the circular economy to, to, to operate uh, and to be, operate sustainably. So uh, uh, it's, it's a big question, it's a big subject. It's, uh, 
the subject of separate webinars. So I don't want to go into the detail, but uh, uh, I do think that we need to get the brand owners who are the main drivers in EPR systems uh, uh, aligned behind the thinking. Uh, we need to recognize what the circular economy looks like as a picture uh, and what's going to be needed to, to make that work economically first, but also uh, from an environmental impact perspective. Thanks, Graham. We have had a lot of more <laughs> questions for Graham. Unfortunately, we have quite a tight schedule, so um, you, you can find Graham on LinkedIn or, or via the CFLEX website, and indeed, um, you can also direct questions to KIDV. Um, thank you very much, Graham, for, for that really great overview of, of CFLEX, which, um, as I implied in my introduction, I think is one of the most exciting uh, collaborative efforts of the packaging industry uh, overall. Um, so yes, I'd like to now um, move on to uh, the second of our presentations and to introduce Gijs Langefeld, who's a project manager at KIDV. Um, he's gonna be talking about uh, the dilemma of flexible packaging and uh, well, how uh, KIDV community of practice is facing that. Over to you, Gijs. Thanks, Tim. Um, well, good afternoon. My name is Gijs, Gijs Langeveld, and together with uh, Niels, uh, Niels van Marler, we coordinated uh, this community of practice about flexible packaging. And the next 10 minutes, I will be talking uh, with you about uh, the dilemma of flexible packaging, and I will be introducing the community of practice to you. So um, we're with six companies, the Friesland Campina, Intersnack, uh, Jacobs Dauer Egberts, uh, Mars Wrigley, uh, PepsiCo, Unilever, uh, and also CFLEX is involved, uh, which uh, Graham just introduced. Um, and finally, of course, uh, the, uh, the Netherlands Institute for Sustainable Packaging. Uh, we organize, we support organizations uh, with uh, increasing uh, your sustainability of packaging uh, individually, but also in groups. And that's what we're doing here in this uh, community of practice. So um, let's first dive into uh, the, the challenge. Uh, to what we see as the, the major challenge is to make, on the one hand to maintain the functionality of packaging uh, and on the other hand to reduce or impact on the planetary boundaries so um, flexible packaging are very efficient packaging um, because uh, there are few materials used uh, there are strong property barriers uh, there's consumer convenience and there's an overall and because of its current overall environmental impact but on the other hand they're more or less single use and uh, they, they do have impact on the uh, different planetary boundaries and we want to reduce that so that's the main challenge um, and what we see is that uh, uh, this is an important challenge to address uh, because brand owners, uh, from their point of perspective, have pledged to reach 100% recyclability of the packaging in 2025. Uh, and flexible packaging is one of the key issues here to tackle this uh, in realizing this pledge. Um, I'm not going into uh, all the details of this uh, graph, you can look at it at home, but uh, what it says is that about one third of all plastic packaging in Europe is flexible consumer packaging. And 80% of the flex of these packaging is recyclable or can or should be recyclable. So uh, there's a, a large potential here and that's why flexible packaging uh, is, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, one of the key subjects. Uh, the other thing is that which drives this challenge is that the, the, the public opinion, uh, EU targets, and, uh, and uh, they also uh, drive towards changes and towards circularity. So it's uh, both from companies as from the society who says, well, we need to go towards a more circular point of view. So, and here comes in the dilemma. So, um, uh, when brand owners design their multi-layer flexible packaging according to the circular pack packaging design guidelines, which uh, uh, we take CFLEX as, uh, as a reference point, uh, at this point, they can actually not claim a realization uh, of increased circularity. So, um, uh, what Graham introduced is that there are three points, uh, uh, three uh, uh, main activities, uh, and they go hand in hand. And if you change your design towards a design for circularity currently, uh, but infrastructure for collection and sorting and recycling is not changed together with it, uh, then uh, uh, you can change whatever you want, but the, 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 the actual circularity doesn't increase or recyclability. So, uh, and there's a gap between the current situation and where we want to go. 
uh, and, the, and uh, we identified in the community of practice certain routes uh, how we can go, how we can manage that gap. So to bridge this gap, um, uh, there, are, there are various sorting and recycling routes available. Uh, we have described these routes uh, uh, and also the no regrets in a roadmap uh, which has been published in, uh, in August last year. And, um, uh, uh, and actually the basics are here on this specific uh, image in the middle. And what it says is that uh, currently uh, um, a flexible packaging is either recycled in a Deca Air 350, 350 or as a PE mono material larger than A4. Um, but what can actually also be done is that you have a look uh, towards uh, uh, streams with a higher uh, quality and uh, potential, like for example, a mixed PO stream instead of uh, a mixed stream where also PET is part of, or uh, uh, a monomere like, uh, 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 like PP, uh, uh, where you can also have uh, maybe sorted separately and uh, recycle it as a mono stream. So, um, that's where we stand right now. Um, uh, an example of a no regret uh, was already mentioned by uh, Graham is that uh, you go from a multi-material towards a mono-material or towards a mixed PO, uh, like uh, uh, um, so that it can be easily recyclable. Uh, if that's not possible, then at least it should be detectable and sorting, because otherwise it's um, uh, lowering the quality of the of the, the mixed uh, um, plastics that you get out of it. So what we've done today, uh, well, what we've done uh, and today we launch it is uh, uh, giving you an information map. Uh, this information map uh, describes all the uh, uh, arguments uh, on the why, the what and the how of this issue. Uh, we've developed it as a community of practice in uh, collaboration with the Argumenta Fabriek. Um, uh, some of the Dutch ones will uh, will sound it, uh, will view it as familiar, and actually it gives an overview of all the arguments on uh, why do you want to move there, uh, what should be done, and how can you do it. Um, this roadmap will be sent to you uh, as a follow up on this on this session, and will be or uh, one of our tools uh, in our next steps, uh, which which supports us with arguments. Uh, and which we can say, well, we need uh, we need to go that way because of this argument or not. At least it facilitates the discussion on uh, where are we moving next. So this group of companies, uh, uh, together with all the stakeholders involved, uh, uh, um, we're still stuck in old habits. And we need to change towards new habits. Um, and that's why we need a group of companies that actually are uh, changing. And that's needed because of the, of the economies of scale. Uh, but it's also needed uh, because uh, uh, we need to collaborate between brand owners and the other value chain stakeholders. So it's a joint effort where we need everybody. And that's the reason why we say, well, for change, we only not only working within the COP, but we're actually working with the whole value chain. So uh, what are our next steps? Um, we have uh, uh, formed two work streams uh, which will support the path forward. Uh, the first one will be a technical one um, uh, uh, where uh, we we're we going to test things uh, and uh, which uh, uh, which is actually technical supporting towards uh, which route are we going to choose or which routes. Um, they work together with CFLEX so that uh, and results are shared both ways so that we don't do things double. Uh, and Dominica, uh, Dominica, uh, uh, Mark Malouzak Dunbar will introduce you towards uh, their activities uh, uh, after this presentation. The second one the work stream is about communication and stakeholder uh, involvement. Um, that's about what are we going to communicate towards uh, clients and also about uh, how are we going to involve all value chain partners. 
Uh, this one will be introduced to you by our other member, Thor Thummer, uh, uh, who is from the from this working uh, after Dominica. And the third element in this in our uh, organization for the next steps is an uh, advisory committee. So, and there are important value chain partners which we want to have a direct uh, critique from the uh, results that we got. Uh, the EPR system, the Dutch EPR system, Affelfonds for Packing is involved. The ministry uh, is involved uh, as legislator. Uh, Natuur and Milieu, it's a Dutch NGO, uh, is involved. Uh, and then the plastic sorters and recyclers are involved through NAK and Plastic Europe. Uh, and uh, uh, not, um, not forgetting to mention the Plastic Pact, the Dutch Plastic Pact is also involved uh, uh, as a platform to uh, where uh, people meet uh, towards uh, more sustainable goals for plastic packaging. So um, this is what we're going to do. We, I'm, I'm, it's great to see all of you to see the great interest. Uh, we would like to. Uh, I would like to uh, tell you much more about what we have done and where we're going, uh, but we don't have the time for that. So uh, thank you very much for your attention, uh, and I'm looking forward to the next presentations and towards uh, the discussion mainly about uh, what will be your next steps. Thank you very much, Gijs. Um, I, we have some questions again from the audience, so don't go away straight away. Um, first Sorry. of all, um, we have a question um, saying, as you mentioned in one of your first slides, almost 80% of the flexible packaging market is uh, already the polyolefin material, and um, in principle, therefore, is recyclable. Um, however, we still have very low um, recycling rates for flexibles. Can you explain why that is? Um, yeah, well, there's not one reason for it, uh, but, but uh, what we have done the last 10, 20 years uh, it was mainly designed uh, uh, to reduce environmental impact. And we've done that by uh, by reducing the, the, the thickness of packaging, uh, which had a great effort, a great impact. And, uh, but, but we didn't uh, actually look uh, into what happens at the end of the chain. So the, envir the environmental impact is going down. But we didn't look what actually uh, uh, happened to the materials. So in the last couple of years, we changed our perspective towards more circularity. Um, and what happens to the flexible packaging in the Netherlands currently is that uh, they are being partly recycled, uh, but it's part of a general mix stream where there's also PET involved, where there are also different plastic parts involved. And we think that the next step could be uh, that uh, that you have a look at how can you create more value by uh, by by uh, uh, monetize uh, by uh, making that specific mix stream more uh, aligned with each other and and, and better be uh, uh, better input for uh, for recycling either mechanical or, re or chemical recycling, so uh, that you actually can create more value and create the business case that Graham was talking. About. Okay, thank you, Gijs. Um, also, um, can I ask, what's the, the need for uh, a Dutch community of practice uh, compared to uh, CFLEX? How, how do they differ in their roles and or complement each other? Well, very good question. Um, well, CFLEX is doing a great job in the, uh, on European level, and, and that's why we're very glad that we collaborate together. Um, but you also need some implementation on national level as well. Um, uh, so CFLEX uh, is, is great by connecting all the stakeholders internationally, but also on local level, uh, we need to align stakeholders and that's where we come in. Uh, and I think uh, uh, it has uh, uh, advantages for both, uh, it has benefits for both sides uh, by, by working together. Uh, we have a national approach, it's easier for us to incorporate all the national stakeholders uh, it's easier to, to have a discussion uh, when the, 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 recycle, the, the collection and sorting system is more or less similar. Uh, we can align testing. Uh, we can, by that, by aligning testing and doing more effort, we can move faster. Uh, and, and finally, I think um, uh, 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 the reason why we work with all uh, uh, large corporations is that also that uh, it's not only relevant for the Netherlands, uh, what we're doing, uh, it can be a, a, an example or a reference for other, uh, um, for other uh, countries in Europe, at least, but probably for the world as well. So, uh, and, and, and that's where we need CFLEX for, to, uh, to, uh, to generate such a reference. 
Thank you. Thank you, Chais. Um, so we are now out of time for our slot, so we'll have to move on. Thanks very much for, sure. for sharing sharing that. Um, so I'd like now to introduce our next two speakers. Um, we have uh, Dominika Marushak, who is a packaging engineer for sustainability at PepsiCo, and Tor Tumas, who is external affairs manager at Unilever. Um, I believe uh, Dominika will be um, uh, going first with uh, talking about her perspectives on uh, community of practice, and then we'll bring in Tor for, for his uh, complementary perspectives. Yes, uh, thank you, Tim, for introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm a part of the global packaging team at PepsiCo, and I'm uh, concentrating on sustainability uh, within Europe. And in this short presentation, I would like to talk you through a little bit of what technical work stream was doing within the KIDB. Uh, I think Reis already um, gave a great bridge and some of this were already tackled during the uh, presentation of Graham. Um, but uh, basically for the Netherlands, what we identified as a main challenges is that the current infrastructure is basically concentrating around PE flex. Uh, from brand owner perspective and also given the future redesign of the packages, uh, PP is equally important material for us. Um, specifically for PepsiCo, what we notice is that PP, metallized PP is currently collected, but unfortunately not recycled in the Netherlands. And um, some of you may ask, why do you actually need that metallization in your package? Well, one of the point of redesigning of the packages, uh, yes, we will be striving and we are busy um, to comply with the redesign guidelines to ensure recyclability. But at the same time, we need to remember that we cannot compromise the quality of our products. So for example, metallization adds a light barrier and prevents our product from oxidation. Um, so sometimes things that may seem very simple are way complex, let's say from the brand owner or, or converter perspective, let's say. And at the same time, what already was mentioned that just a simple redesign doesn't solve the issue. So without the proper infrastructure, and uh, um, having a system in place, we will still not be able to achieve that recyclability because even if we redesign the material, but there is no proper collection or sorting, we are still not there. Um, so therefore, what the uh, guys also mentioned, the goal would be to establish or PP specific or at least PO flex uh, waste stream to ensure that we can achieve those goals. As a starting point within the COP, we did kind of desktop uh, research to understand a little bit of that uh, flex situation and specifically for PP. And we realized that although there are some reports available, um, the data varies quite some. And for specific target groups like PP flex, there is not much to be found. Therefore, we decided to design a, a trial plan to learn a little bit more about the current situation. Uh, within this trial, the idea was to answer two main questions. Uh, so first of all, what is the amount of all PP flex in the Dutch waste stream? And secondly, can we sort it out? And can we use metallized PP as a new feedstock for uh, new end market applications? And uh, as a new, let's say, application, I don't, of, of course, aspiration would be go back to back, means to new flexible packaging. Um, However, we also need to think about different type of application that are still valuable uh, in the market. So we had uh, several partners in this uh, trial project. So as a testing facility, we have selected NTCP, which is the National Center for Circular Plastic. And um, NTCP has a, basically a pilot line which reproduces the industrial st standard of sorting lines. And we had a, a four brand owners so graciously contributed to the trial. So that's Mars Wrigley, Intersnack, uh, Frisant Campina, and us. And just to give you a bit of headlines of the scale of the trial. So it's just the beginning step, um, but basically what we did, we used um, waste uh, input from two way of collections that are available in the Netherlands. So that one is a MSW, which is a, let's say mixed stream waste post-consumer. Uh, so for, for Dutch known as a gray container. 
and uh, PMD, which is basically source separated waste stream, so that responds for the plastic, metal, and the drink carton separate collection. And the scale of it is was the input material was about 500 kilograms for each. And uh, uh, KSI Omrin was uh, the one who uh, provided us with the waste uh, material. And the waste was collected in the urban area. Uh, we are still in the process of analyzing the data and uh, finishing some steps, but uh, I would say as a very first takeouts uh, and maybe not necessarily surprising uh, to some extent is that the trial has showed already that there is pretty significant portion of flex uh, loss in the sorting process. So uh, let's say yield and efficiency of the current setup uh, sometimes doesn't bring us uh, to the level we would love to be. Um, Another very important point is that uh, uh, we've seen that metallized PP, uh, there is a significant higher portion of that material in the MSW than PMD, which also tells us that consumer basically maybe not necessarily know what to do with that package. So it basically goes to the rest waste rather than to separated plastic waste. Um, uh, if you look at the quantity of PP and both stream was pretty comparable. Um, but I think what is important to say is that in the light fraction, the portion of PP was about one third of all flexibles in the stream. So if you if you think about that, the focus is right now on PE only, and PP at minimum is one third of the total flex. That's definitely a high quantity and I would say deserves a stream or a consideration at least. And I think as a, as a main and the most important is to say that with redesign, uh, complying with the guidance, uh, uh, redesign guidance for recyclability and PE and PP will be two main polymers considered by brand owners and converters. So we need to ensure that uh, there is available uh, infrastructure to process that material and uh, there is enough uh, infrastructure to accept potentially increasing uh, and from the brand owner perspective, I would say for sure increasing uh, PP quantity in that stream. And I would say as a finishing message, I would uh, just repeat what probably was already said that uh, basically um, this is a battle not of single company. It's, a, uh, I would say, entire uh, value chain involvement to solve the issue. And uh, by, by this, I would like to engage, uh, let's say, all the members to take this uh, trial to the fur further steps, so to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dominika. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Tor Tumas now to, to share his uh, perspectives on the community of practice. Yes, hello everybody. Uh, thanks for being here. And um, uh, that's a nice bridge from uh, Dominika's presentation that we need a lot of more value chain partners and the government involvement um, uh, to really create circular uh, flexibles. Um, so, uh, first of all, why did we use these flexibles in the first place? Because we also see some discussion about moving to alternatives, as Graham already outlined in the beginning uh, about the benefits. Uh, these are some, um, some, some points and of reference why we use these type of uh, packaging in the first place and why also we should all would like to protect this format and improve it towards the future. Uh, some of the points are already known to a, a lot of you, but it's flexible, lightweight, um, there are strong and good barrier properties, um, but it also um, can function as a refill. So I've taken this, uh, this example um, uh, where our Dolph hand wash is refilled with a, a twice the size refill pack in the form of a flexible, uh, reducing 60% of 80% of, of the plastic packaging that we would require for the, the, the normal packaging with the pump. Um, what we do need, of course, is some more advanced sorting uh, and some mechanical and chemical recycling to process it. But where do we start? And um, uh, what we try to do in the stakeholder communications work stream is discuss 
all uh, points of attention or all interventions that we would need to create circular fle flexibles uh, on three levels of uh, communication, three levels of information. So first of all, we need to make it very easy and instructive for people who are not really into this discussion. Let's start with a broad consumer group. Consumers need to get the information that uh, that is a call for action for them. And that of course refers to collection. Uh, if we do not collect, we don't have the materials to process them adequately. So therefore a very simple and concise information towards consumer uh, to, for instance, on disposal instructions and uh, perhaps claims or further explanations uh, why we use this format. Um, that's the easy part. Uh, but something that is not being done broadly enough yet, so something to work on or also with our retail uh, partners. Level two, where we need to provide more extended information, uh, explaining the brand stories, but also uh, the approach that how we are working with these uh, formats, these packaging formats towards circularity. Uh, we got a lot of questions and I can really say that the amount of questions from informed consumers, but also discussions across the value chain have been increasing uh, a number of times and are really high on the agenda. So flexibles in particular, but also more broadly packaging, packaging waste is a top priority for both governments and businesses. So that's why we need to act. Um, having a clear view of how we can drive the transformation or the transition towards circular flexibles, uh, we need also be very open about, uh, about our efforts and about what we would like from other partners across the value chain and the legislators. Um, so level three is about providing a lot more detailed background um, uh, towards the EU uh, governmental uh, relations, uh, but also uh, telling the entire story with media, how we can create circularity uh, and how that, that benefits our total sustainability impact and also expressing CO2 reductions or material optimization uh, or absolute reduction of plastics. Uh, you name it, there are a lot of uh, commitments from individual companies or overall targets that can be met by, uh, uh, by creating this unlock. So how then do we do that in terms of the value chain? And um, I've used the, the, the C-Flex uh, outline that Graham already mentioned in the beginning. Um, there are some key changes that are, are already happening. So also saw some comments in the chat about uh, collection and about the, uh, the guidance towards consumers. And frankly, it has been quite confusion. Uh, but it's very difficult for consumers to understand which flexible is metallized or is a multi-layer or can't be recycled or should be recycled. So um, the Dutch government, together with the, um, the industry partners, then decided we should make that a lot easier. And there was an agreement with the EPR organization and the local municipalities to at least collect all types of package, plastic packaging, uh, allow them with the plastic waste. So that's a good starting point on harmonizing that consumer information that we at least collect. Uh, as Dominica also mentioned, um, now the material is being collected, uh, isn't necessarily sorted and processed um, sufficiently. So that's our next step. Um, so in the sorting on the right hand, uh, we need to stimulate that advanced sorting so that at least all types of flexibles can be sorted out and the technologies here there, there are already a lot of good technologies in the marketplace at scale so this is something that that can be done and to create a few mono streams of materials that are efficient uh, to recycle it sounds like a paradox but we need the problem to be to become greater and greater problem requires a solution so now when we collect more flexibles the stream get bigger and a bigger stream is of course more efficiently or makes more sense to recycle it uh, versus a very small uh, fraction. Uh, on the design guidelines, we need to uh, make sure that we also improve our designs to make recycling or processing and recycling easier. Uh, so that deals with the recycling guidelines that were already mentioned, but it also links to um, uh, covering or at least taking the entire environmental impact of this packaging format into account and think about future solutions. So if we are currently in 2021, moving towards 2025, which a lot of companies have a target on 100% reci recyclable packaging, how does 2025 then look like and what investments should we do right now to make sure that we end up there in a, in a good place together with these partners across the value chain. 
Um, and I'm talking about several solutions. So material uh, information sharing, but also on, uh, uh, on chemical recycling or advanced sorting mechanisms. So there's a lot to gain there. And I think this also links in nicely with environment and innovation. So we can really uh, discuss our stakeholder view with um, or discuss our view with stakeholders that we need to address both and we can do both by uh, investing in innovation as well and that's also the willingness of the companies that uh, that formed the co uh, this coalition um, but moving towards the uh, scaling of the uh, innovative recycling technologies and the high quality output that also links in with the discussion on uh, creating a higher level of uptake of recycled content so if we want to have uh, uh, circular flexibles, we should not be totally dependent on fossil-based uh, plastics. So we require high quality, for instance, food safe or very, uh, very high quality uh, re recyclate to use the new packs again. So therefore we need to invest in recycling technologies can on one hand cope with the more difficult part, let's say the top 20%, so the multi-layer flexibles, uh, but also for a little bit broader group, um, deliver high quality output. And that's also as a benefit that you can probably uh, create a PO stream, so PP and PE together, uh, deal with kind of inks or labels, etc. Uh, but then the marketplace isn't really helping. So the, the discussions on the low oil prices and that this is uh, kind of a challenge for the circular plastics in general, also rigids to uh, to pick up, is of course one of the biggest dilemmas we we currently face together. Um, so we need to develop a mature market for secondary raw materials, and where there's a price gap, we need to discuss interventions that can close of can at least dis diminish that price gap by either creating long term certainty for investing in new technologies. Uh, by takeoff agreements or by uh, other governmental incentives to make sure that it also is rewarding to use and reuse recycled content in new uh, packaging formats. So when you see all these actions across the value chain, you will notice this is not something a few brand owners or a few retailers or a few packaging providers can do by themselves. Uh, it requires action from all of us. And that's what we also try to do. Instead of pointing fingers, uh, someone across the value chain has to do something uh, and then we can act. Now we should act already and make sure that it, it is rewarding for the next step in the value chain to act as well. And um, uh, to be honest, I think these discussions have been quite constructive uh, amongst partners and uh, there's a lot of recognition and a lot of desired uh, shared ambition to make this happen. Um, I hope we can, uh, can really accelerate this change um, because we can all benefit from it, but we're not yet there. I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you very much, Tor. And I'd also like to uh, invite uh, Dominika back if uh, uh, she's still had several questions from the uh, the audience today. Um, can we just start by by asking? Um, obviously, you've you've outlined outlined a lot of actions and aspirations that you want to address uh, around the the issue of flexible packaging. Do you have any sense of how you would want to prioritize those actions uh, in terms of the speed and the impact? Is is there anything that's really, really top of the agenda for you? Yeah, I think that uh, uh, there's some low-hanging fruit as we so would we call to take it. First. Yeah, of course. There's some low-hanging fruit on um, uh, on the flexibles that are already recyclable. So there's a lot of packaging out there that can be processed, uh, but we're lacking the incentives. So we, I think that's a really good place to start. Also by demonstrating that that can happen at scale. Uh, and we shouldn't try to uh, crack the nut on multi-layer flexibles towards uh, food quality output yet, because that might be the most difficult one. But let's solve the 80% uh, for first and then uh, take it from there. So monomaterial PE streams towards a, a new end product. Dominica, would you agree with that? Anything you would like to add? Yeah, I totally agree. It's, it's sometimes about baby steps, I would say. Uh, so, of course, long-term vision and greater aspiration is about, you know, even getting it back to the food contact materials. But I would say, instead of awaiting and saying it's not possible, I think what CFLEX is doing and what we are doing within the technical work stream is actually running those trials and 
proving that actually it is possible, it's feasible, and these are the first step to give that incentive. Of course, we need a commitment of uh, members of, uh, of the total value chain because you need recyclers, you need uh, obviously the EPR system to support that, especially with the low prices of the virgin uh, plastics right now. Uh, but I would say one step at a time. Thank you. Um, we've had a few questions and quite a lively debate in the uh, in the audience discussion about consumer information and um, the potential confusion um, that can uh, rule among consumers when there are lots of different packaging types and formats and recycling streams. And uh, again, I'm going to generalize across a few questions that we've had, but. Um, do you have any ideas about the roles that uh, brand owners could play in helping to educate and uh, inform consumers about uh, the appropriate actions at end of life um, and generally how we can face this challenge when there's so much fragmentation across uh, different national and even you know, regional uh, waste management infrastructures? Yes. So uh, I can uh, can have a have a go, and Dominica, please uh, share uh, share your thoughts. So first, we want to make it easy for consumers, and easy will mean a perspective how to handle, but also uh, something that is doable and wouldn't require too much effort. So let's say empty your packs and uh, make sure you dispose of them correctly. And correctly should also be easy, either. PMD in the Netherlands or in a gray bag where there's no PMD. Um, but uh, on that point, I think the, the risk is that we have some, um, uh, some policy also on a local level, uh, providing consumers with a lot of little bit financially driven incentives to act differently. And I think we should really try to harmonize that. I know the EU is already looking uh, on possibilities to harmonize collection infrastructure, but my main point would be also harmonize collection policies uh, that is easier for consumers to understand and even if there's a little bit of suboptimal results on a regional level we can definitely benefit uh, when you view that at a, at a larger or more at a higher level uh, so ease for consumers is uh, is key there and how, and in parallel to that i think we need to make sure that we also invest in the uh, technologies that are behind that because machines can offer a lot of solutions there. Um, so we should do that in parallel. So consumers are also at ease that what they're already doing is, is definitely contributing in total and not um, creating a new issue. Yeah, I, I agree here. And obviously sorting processes can help, let's say with uh, separating those materials to the separate streams that are, uh, let's say, valuable for specific recyclers, uh, whatever the recycling means. is. Uh, but obviously, uh, consumers should not be confused what to do with the package. So yes, it's in our role to simplify the message. And as Tor mentioned, sometimes it's a little bit complicated also due to the, uh, let's say, differences in the guides or the rules. Um, but uh, we, we do recognize, and that was actually one of the points of the discussions within the community of practice, that uh, there is still quite some confusion uh, let's say between consumers what to do with the certain packages and I think our package specifically can be one of the example obviously especially with the metallization uh, different resources say different things uh, and obviously uh, even me as a consumer I should do that intuitively knowing this is a plastic package I know what to do with it right so uh, yes we we recognize that Thank you. Um, great. And um, just one final question then before we take our break. Um, we've had a question asking whether what you're doing within your community of practice um, is the same or additional in terms of the trials uh, on recycling of packaging um, compared with uh, the CFLEX ones. Um, what's the relationship there? Uh, obviously, there is some difference uh, because the trial was focusing specifically on the Netherlands. So it's a little bit more on understanding the current structure in the Netherlands, but also tackling specifically that PP with, because the understanding is a little bit uh, low. And at the same time, uh, if you look, for example, at the Germany, you have the PO flex already established. Uh, the Netherlands, we have DKR, uh, DKR 350, which is a mix of all plastics. So it's PE below A4 uh, and all other flexible plastics. So it's a mix, right, also of the PET in there. 
Um, so we don't have that established separate stream for that more valuable polyolefins. Um, and therefore the trial was designed to understand and tackle the Netherlands specifically. Thank you, Dominica. So um, we've run out of time. Um, thank you very much to, to both of you and thanks to all of our speakers. I, I think on reflection, we could have spent two hours having really fruitful dis discussions with every single one of you. Um, so uh, lots of questions that we'd like to, to return to, I'm sure. Um, but we'll take a five minute short break now. Um, time for everyone to make a coffee. If you're working from home, um, it's a chance for you to, to check whether your animals or your children are misbehaving. And we will be back in five minutes for uh, the panel discussion. So I'll, I'll leave you now for Thank five you. minutes. Thank you, everyone.
Can you please turn on your audio, please? Because we cannot hear you. Thank you for that. I, uh, <laughs> I had a really great introduction there and no one heard anything I said. Um, apologies and um, welcome back everyone to part two of today's webinar for which uh, we have a panel which is representing different areas of expertise and different perspectives on the, the practical challenges surrounding the ongoing development of a circular economy and flexibles. I'm very pleased to introduce our panelists today. We have Tiako Twicht, who is Director of Business Development at the Dutch Waste Fund, Arnold Passenier, who is uh, Advisor for Circular Economy International at the Dutch Ministry of Environment, Yelma Fiestra, who is a program leader for circular economy at Nature in Milieu, Dana Masora, Workstream Consultant at Cflex, and Niels van Mahler, who is a sustainable packaging expert at KIDV. Welcome, uh, everyone. Uh, great to have you on the panel. So in the coming discussion, we really want to focus on the work that we still have to do and hopefully to identify the dilemmas and pressure points um, in maybe some areas of disagreement and trade-offs uh, where we really have to find uh, decisions and compromises uh, over the, the coming months. Uh, we'll be framing this discussion around three polls and starting off by asking you, the audience, to share uh, your views. Um, so let's start off with the most fundamental question, I suppose. Uh, what are the goals that we are trying to achieve? Um, can I ask us to put uh, the first poll up and we'll ask the, the audience to uh, give their answer before our panelists do. Great. So which of the following goals do you consider the highest priority in making flexible plastic packaging circular? So the first option is maximizing output quality, aiming for recycled content in new packaging in order to reduce uh, the use of virgin materials. Minimizing the CO2 impact in overall value chain is the second option. Maximizing quantitative recycling rates, rates uh, focusing on EU goals is the third. And finally, minimizing cost in waste management systems. I'll just give you a few more seconds to make up your, uh, your minds there. So at the moment we have a strong lead for quality over quantity, but still a lot of votes coming in. So I'll give you another 10 seconds to put in your final votes. Okay, let's let's end the poll there. So we have a clear majority, about two thirds of, of uh, the audience have said that they would prioritize maximizing output quality. Um, let's see, um, let's start by reflecting on, on that poll um, panelists. Um, where would you vote and, and are you surprised by that answer? Um, let's start with uh, Tiako. Um, what, how would you have voted in that poll? Well, I would have voted for maximizing the quantitative recycling rate because that's simply what we do as an EPR scheme is we try to reach the targets, the EU goals. But uh, I must say that if we don't improve the output quality at the moment or find more applications for the material that we're collecting and sorting, then we're not going to reach those targets. So um, maybe, you know, I don't think these goals are actually contradicting each other. But uh, yeah, so in prioritizing. I, I feel for both for maximizing the quantitative recycling rate, but also, of course, we have to maximize output quality to actually get there. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Dana, I, I suspect you may have um, voted differently in, in the poll. Uh, how do you come down on these issues? Can you hear me, Dana? Oh, I think your, your, um, your mic may be muted. Okay, ah, uh, sorry. Uh, I was saying actually, uh, Kim, that I would have voted along the same lines of the majority of those who voted here. I do believe that the time has come for us to put the quality as a priority because this type of change of the status quo would help um, 
packaging and particular flexible packaging um, real, realize the circular economy. However, I recognize the importance of minimizing the CO2 impact as well. Uh, because um, one thing which is not yet said here, but um, I believe strongly as, as representative of CFLEX here, that um, when you talk about recycling, you have to talk about both mechanical and chemical recycling. And then the question is, what about the CO2 impact? And here is where um, we have to manage it in such a way that the two solutions balanced in a rational way, making sure that the overall CO2 impact of recycling remains um, remains uh, lower than in a non-circular economy. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And as, as Tiako said, um, you know we've we've made some arbitrary uh, decisions in this poll, but um, they're not necessarily uh, goals that are in tension with each other. Uh, and you know, in, in principle, no one is opposed to driving up both quality and quantity. Um, Arnold, I'd like to ask you to give your perspective from a, a government policy point of view here. Um, yes, thank you. How, how would you see this? Um, well, I, I voted for the uh, CO2 impact um, because in the end, it's about the underlying goals we have with, um, um, with the circular economy. And it's not only about um, having um, uh, as much as uh, uh, possible uh, collected and sorted and recycled and reused again. So the quality issue is certainly uh, important. But at the same time, it's um, about getting um, getting rid of um, the um, wastage of uh, of uh, packaging and, um, and and plastics. Uh, so. Um, uh, reuse models, which I didn't hear um, uh, much uh, about, um, even with uh, flexible packaging, um, should be investigated as well um, uh, to um, uh, to reduce uh, CO2 emissions and to, to reduce um, um, uh, wastage uh, of uh, of packaging. And so that's why I think that um, um, you always have to look back to the origin. What do you want to to tackle, and um, with um, with that in mind, I I, I saw well. It's uh, it's important to um, to have an overall objective and um, uh, incentives um, uh, also to um, uh, have more re reusable packaging um, uh, in in place. So we have to look further. Indeed. And in fact, there were quite a lot of questions and, and discussions in the audience chat in the first half, which, which didn't quite relate directly to the speakers, so I didn't raise it, but um, quite a lot of uh, discussion about prioritizing reuse where possible. Um, I guess one of the problems with reuse is that, and, and when we're talking about flexibles, is that we're looking at a lot of um, food applications, food contact, and um, packaging applications, which are Maybe harder to envisage um, reusable uh, options. Um, would anyone care to to follow up on that point of, of, of how reuse could uh, enable us to avoid uh, um, going through the the cycle of, of recycling? Perhaps I can. Um, Niels, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Um, Yes. I, I really agree with uh, with Arnaud about the the ultimate target you have, and I think you can uh, uh, express that in CO two impact. So even when you need to compare the use of flexible material and reuse, you should always measure the environmental impact. And in some situation, reuse can be beneficial. But in some situations, it will not, because what the essence of flexible packaging is that you have a very minimal amount of material with a, a relative high functionality. And I know from calculations we've made in the past that it is very difficult to compete with them. But I'm sure that there's no single option. I think you need to have multiple options in your uh, working, uh, in, in your tool set 
because it is not that we can go 100% for uh, reuse, 100% for flexible packaging. No, I think you need to find the be best balance and find the right type of packaging for the right purpose. Thanks very much. Um, and uh, Yelma, where, where did you come down in this poll? And, and, well, and, uh, and how, uh, how does that reflect on... Sorry, go ahead. Uh, um, I was looking for an option that wasn't there. Um, at, at first, I agree with Anand, obviously. Um, CE is not a goal in itself. It's a means to meet a goal, and that's to minimize the impact uh, on the environment of our economy. So therefore, for the short term, I would say, uh, focus on CO2 impact, but in the end, uh, you know, our energy system will become climate neutral and then uh, um, maximizing output quality would be uh, the long-term uh, goal. Um, so that was my choice, but obviously when it comes to uh, flexible packaging, I work for an environmental NGO. I see a lot of flex flexible packaging still ending up in nature. So preventing uh, prevention of ending uh, flexible packaging ending up in nature would be my primary goal. Um, and I think well, in the Netherlands, we have a deposit return system now for uh, big bottles, small bottles coming up, cans coming up, EPR systems for chewing gum, cigarette butts. So within two years, flexible packaging will be the big one in, uh, in litter. And uh, well, that's it. that's it basically. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I'd, I'd like to, to follow up on, on this question of, you know, we would like to obviously have universal recycling, so greater quantities and uh, better quality so that we're delivering better quality PCR through to the next cycles. Um, in terms of policy goals, where are the tensions? Where, what is it that stops us from, from doing both? Uh, again, Arnold, could, uh, could you uh, comment on that? Well, um, for sure, um, um, we um, we should um, look at um, at, at uh, possibilities to um, um, to um, to engage uh, the whole community more, much more in out of the box uh, thinking. Uh, not only we have packaging because they they had a fun functionality, and we have to improve that uh, more. But uh, rethinking um, the whole system of uh, services, uh, which uh, should um, reflect um, uh, what you want to present to the to the customers. So, and that can be without packaging, um, um, with uh, different logistical systems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it goes far beyond um, the incremental. Um, uh, innovations um, uh, which are uh, part of the um, uh, of the um, uh, COP. Uh, so um, one of the things which we are discussing now in Parliament, in in uh, in our um, uh, ministry, is how to um, set uh, targets on on reuse, uh, but maybe sometimes also on uh, on refuse um, of um, of packaging. Uh, but for that, it's. Uh, always very complicated because you, you have to look at the, at, at the service and the products and uh, which uh, have to be packaged or have to be uh, uh, transported to um, uh, to retailers etc uh, so it's a really complicated uh, discussion but I, th I think in the next couple of years those targets will be there and um, um, to um, so everyone has to prepare on um, um, thinking much more out of the box uh, um, uh, to come with new solutions. Thank you. Um, okay, I think let's let's move on to our second poll, and we're going to now um, burrow into more concrete implications of those end of life scenarios and, and how they should develop. Um, so, uh, can we put up the second poll? Again, let's we're phrasing this question to try to explore tensions. Um, the question that we're asking is, which scenario do you consider the most realistic for processing flexible packaging? First of all, um, keeping the status quo, applying large volumes of low-grade recyclate and accepting that some will be incinerated. 
Secondly, target for optimal me mechanical recycling with better sorting and strong focus on monomaterials. Or thirdly, target directly for chemical recycling, whether that's pyrolysis or solvolysis, and focus on mixed polyolefin packaging materials. We have in the comments someone saying the best scenario is all three together, um, but uh, <laughs> that's not a way of uh, exploring our tension. So that's why we've we've arbitrarily asked you to to, to choose one of these options. So unsurprisingly, the status quo is not proving a very popular option here. I'll give you another ten seconds or so to to complete the voting. Right, let's, let's, let's finish the voting there. Um, so we have a very clear winner once again. Um, the second option of uh, optimizing the mechanical recycling system with, with better sort, sorting and a strong focus on monomaterials. Um, so once again, um, how did our audience, sorry, our, our speakers uh, come down in this poll? Uh, Yelma, first of all, uh, where would you have uh, voted? Well, actually, I'm quite happy with the result of the poll so far. Uh, I would have thought that the, the silver bullet of chemical recycling would have been uh, uh, higher here. Um, and, and, and actually, that's what worries us, us a bit as an NGO, because uh, with current state of technology, um, mechanical recycling is the most favorable route. I think uh, Weister Polymer Recycling Plan shows that also for flexibles, there are uh, possibilities to um, to recycle at least to new packaging, not yet food quality, but to new packaging at least. Um, well, mechanical recycling outperforms chemical recycling of plastic waste from an environmental perspective, and uh, especially pyrolysis and gasification, quite poor LCA performance at this uh, point. Um, I think it's even doubtful to consider it recycling. It's rather a form of recovery, I guess. Um, Covalysis and uh, depolymerization, very promising technologies, um, especially to meet quality challenges, obviously. So let's focus on both, but uh, be very careful. It is about uh, the environmental performance and, uh, and, and not just about material recovery. Okay, thank you. So uh, I'm gonna bring in Dana straight away. I'm pretty sure um, you will take issue with some of the things that Yelma just said. Um, I know that within uh, the CFLEX project, you've been working on the work stream that's exploring uh, chemical recycling. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll let you respond. Yeah, um, and let me just say, um, starting that uh, while I, I, I really uh, think that mechanical recycling is, is the first option, chemical recycling, I'm surprised that it came out in this poll um, so disproportionately low. I would have hoped that it will come um, a, a higher percentage because I, I said it uh, already once, what we need is to establish the right proportion between the two in such a way that number one, we realize the circular economy and number two, that we have the right um, overall cost and CO2 impact, which would be favorable um, and would be better than in a non-circular economy. Of course, nobody has today the possibility to be precise in what is the ideal ratio, um, but one without the other one, that's something which we're pretty sure looking at the facts that will not work. Um, and um, putting all the hope in, in one or the other one or putting all the hope in mechanical um, might be very unrealistic because there are limitations to how much you can um, mechanically recycle and what type of quality you can get after a lot of recycling the same polymers that's why we have the chemistry and that's why the beauty of science is that it can deliver on ambitious goals uh, which are to keep the materials in the economy and and close the loop right um, I don't know if I answered fully to your question, but 
I looking really at the answers, I I find interesting where we are today in the general perception. Okay, thank you, um, Niels. How do you uh, come down on this chemical versus mechanical, or chemical and mechanical? Yeah, I, I would like to first point a little bit at maintain status quo. In my daily work, in, in my daily conversations, I hear this alternative also frequently, especially concerning uh, flexible packaging. Because flexible packaging bring a lot of pollution with a very little amount of material due to the the the, the essential uh, um, how do you call it uh, the essence of flexible packaging so i'm surprised that not many more people voted for this because in the professional world you hear, hear this alternative a lot but i think status quo is never good we are in a changing environment so we should change and i think uh, it is a, a sequence of things and i think when you prepare for a very well mechanical recycling, take out the best out of it, you will focus on sorting. And I think when I uh, listen to the specialists on chemical recycling, the needs for um, sorting steps are similar or even the same for chemical recycling than mechanical recycling. So I think when you first focus on mechanical recycling, which is present today and where there's capacity today, you're already aiming for the right direction for the preparation for chemical recycling as soon as it delivers. And I think the, my fear on chemical recycling is at the moment it has a lot of CO2 impact. So yes, you recycle, but the ultimate goal of having a, a better CO2 impact might not be achieved, not from the start at least. So I see it as a sequence of things. Okay, thank you. Um, Arnold, uh, could I ask you for your, your views on this? Yes, um, from, from an environmental uh, point of view, um, uh, I agree with uh, Yoma that um, um, if it's possible to um, uh, to mechanically recycle the, uh, the, the flexibles, then we should do. Uh, because of the um, environmental footprint, the CO2 footprint. Um, but mechanical recycling has its limitations as well. Uh, so, um, um, uh, one of the elements of uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, possibilities with uh, chemical recycling is that you can uh, chemical recycle um, to the end that you can reuse the materials back into uh, the packaging itself and and um, also the food grade pack of food contact materials um, and that option i um, uh, find very uh, very promising so um, i think uh, that um, in a lot of um, uh, issues it's better to um, uh, to have um, chemical recycling sometimes uh, preferred to uh, mechanical recycling in food contact materials. Um, to the other uh, issue mentioned by Niels is that um, I think that um, you have to compare not only mechanical and chemical recycling, but also uh, the other option of incineration. And if um, you have a lot of contamin contaminated um, materials, um, which are mechanically not um, feasible to, to have a good quality um, recycled materials in the end, um, I rather prefer pyrolysis um, because uh, it's, it has um, a better um, um, LCA um, outcome than incineration. Uh, it's, it's also um, better for the uh, for climate. Uh, so. Um, Yes, I think that um, uh, we should have both, uh, uh, as Dana said, um, uh, in a, a certain um, mix uh, of um, uh, of recycling options. Uh, and of course, if um, if it's possible to have um, high quality chemical recycling, so such as uh, solvolysis and uh, depolymerization, then I would prefer uh, that above um, uh, paralysis and uh, gasification and gasification i agree with the uh, yomer that is almost the same as uh, incineration and uh, 
as um, um, yes, it, it's, it costs a lot of uh, energy to um, uh, energy input. Uh, so I think that um, that's the the scope uh, where we at, uh, at the government are uh, thinking about. Thank you, Arnold. Um, so I, I guess um, if we hadn't phrased this uh, poll question as an either or, but more as a, a nuanced question, most people would have closer alignment on this panel around the fact that, that we want um, quantity and quality. We want to have uh, uh, as much mechanical as, is, uh, as can deliver the uh, quality of PCR that we want. And possibly there's a role for chemical um, ahead of that. So if we explore that in a slightly more nuanced way, um, where, the, where the balance lies and how we can address the problems and, and, and limitations of the respective uh, recycling technologies. Um, let's think first of all about uh, mechanical, um, where, where are the limitations here? Um, uh, Dana, you were talking about the um, uh, need for quality PCR to uh, to go into food contact applications after that. Um, wh where do we see the opportunities to maximize the uh, mechanical recycling output um, technologically or infrastructurally? Um, would anyone like to, to offer any uh, suggestions there of how we can really boost that, uh, uh, maximize what we can get from, from the mechanical stream? And maybe Tim then. Um, okay. Um, so. Um, yes. Um, well, yeah, what I would ahead. like to comment on this, uh, these three scenarios, is that uh, I think that we need, like, a, an ecosystem for circularity, which means that we need all the different options, of course, and um, that might that might make it quite difficult for the producers, and importers who are choosing how to do, design their packaging, because. Even within a country, you will have different systems, uh, but they'll have to design their packaging for all the different types of uh, chains that you might find in one country or one Europe. And in any ecosystem, I think that the sorting, Niels already mentioned it, is going to be key. So even if the chemical recycling is going to pull the material out, they're going to do so with an intensive sorting step that might also be very helpful for the mechanical recyclers to uh, well to learn from that. Uh, we, and it's for me, it's clear that we have to invest more in, or the, the chain as a whole, the ecosystem as a whole, has got to invest more in sorting. And that's not only for packaging, but we should also uh, remember that there's more than packaging plastics going around. And uh, maybe we can have uh, an ecosystem where the first step would be going from a flexible packaging into a uh, uh, an agglomerate, kind of a, the thicker material products, and then take those thicker products when their uh, when their life is ended, and then chemical recycle those, and then go back into packaging, for example, so that you do this cascading first. There are more options than just even these three. Hmm. Thank you. And well, I, I suppose something I had in the back of my mind when I asked my my question was also the very exciting promise of uh, things like the holy grail digital watermarking as as a way of, as, as Chaco just said, um, really um, taking sorting to the next level and, and enabling us to, to to get the most out of, of uh, the mechanical stream. I think um, we've already, we're already seeing it in the, the sorting of the, the non-flexible packaging, new technologies coming up. Uh, the AI is of course a development and uh, who knows what we can do in, in flex, uh, flexible sorting. Yes, it's definitely a very, very exciting space to, to watch over the, the coming years. Um, let's, let's also ask the same question then about chemical recycling. Um, some concerns have already been raised. Um, and Dana, I'm, I'm turning to you as the, uh, the defender of chemical recycling on, on this panel. Um, where do you see the, the key roadblocks and challenges um, in, in chemical recycling? And, and uh, do you see um, reasons to be optimistic that, that those can be uh, uh, overcome? 
Well, thank you for putting the question. Um, and, and it's great to, uh, to debate this question. Um, chemical recycling, uh, it's something new which needs development and needs attention and focus. And the focus should drive acceleration of the development such that it can deliver what is needed for a circular economy and moreover what is needed such as we protect the, the planet as well. Um, and this can happen because uh, histories of, of science and technology demonstrated that when we put the right resources, we can uh, address the technical challenges and the chemical industry is young enough and strong enough to deliver. But it needs a focus and it needs really uh, for the industry to feel confident in putting, uh, in not losing the focus and continuing to invest in R&D and in the technology development to bring it there. So um, number one, the legislation has to be favorable because if it's not, then that confidence of putting the resources and investing is not there and then we're going to lose the, the, the momentum and we're not going to accelerate the growth. Um, and, and then the other thing is um, it, it really requires more than anything else, I'm observing collaboration because the challenges are important and it does take the collaboration between those who can contribute to developing chemical recycling as it should. Um, I'm talking of the, about the petrochemical industry, the technology providers, but also the waste management. Um, and and Shaco said it very well, uh, sorting, the quality of sorting has to be developed because if it's mechanical or, or uh, chemical, you need the same quality in sorting because you need to very well define the, the strings and and this requires collaboration so we need the government we need the legislation we need the collaboration um, and we need to give it the time necessary but enabling to keep the focus yes yeah i would observe that you know almost all of the disruptive innovations that i can can think of that have made a difference over my lifetime started off small and possibly not very viable and um they they required that that initial support and investment to to overcome their um, their um, initial shortcomings and uh, uh, economic uh, challenges. Um, okay, great. Let's let's move on then to um, the third and final poll uh, that we're going to ask the audience today, um, and this is going to be focusing now on something that Dana helpfully just alluded to, um, who is responsible for for driving uh, the progress that we all aspire to. Um, so the question is, who is to take the next step in making flexible plastic packaging circular? Again, there's no all of the above option, otherwise we would have unanimity, which is always boring in, uh, in panel discussions. So um, the, the options available to you are EU government, national government, producers and importers of packaged goods, sorting and recycling infrastructure, and extended producer responsibility schemes. So again, we have something in the lead. It's not quite as clear cut as some of our other polls though. And I'll give you another 10 seconds to complete the poll. Okay, let's finish it there then. So we have um, just under half saying that the EU is the, the chief driver that we're looking to, but also significant focus on EPR and uh, not a small number for uh, producers' importance of packaged goods. So, um, panelists, um, all of the above wasn't a, a uh, an option there, but I'm sure we would agree that we want all stakeholders to, to play their part. Um, looking at all of those options, um, I'd like to ask each of you, where do you think stakeholders um, need to do more than they are at the moment? So, you know, we, we agree that they all have to do something, but where are we most lacking in um, the leadership that 
we uh, expect from them or do we think that they're providing leadership that's that's not pushing in the right direction um so i'll ask each of you this question and i will start with uh, yelma well thank you uh, again, a surprising result. I thought I was the only NGO here, but still uh, over 50% expect the government to act. Um, but obviously, I was one of them. Um, I think what, 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 what we need is, is three things. At first, there's, there's um, uh, the producers and the importers of packaged products, because what we truly need is uh, cooperation. Because, uh, and not only in the chain, but also between competing companies, because uh, in the end, we don't have to process an individual packaging of Unilever, but what we have to process is a waste pile that is a mix of packages from all brand owners. So if we want to improve recyclability, then all business have to sort of convert, converge their, uh, their packaging policies. But I think there's also a role of uh, the EPR scheme uh, um, uh, actors, because I think we are currently sort of experimenting with uh, tariff differentiation in the Netherlands, but still, it's a lot about what the actual costs, and we don't create tariff differences that really incentivize change. Therefore, the tariffs difference are too uh, small, and I think EPR in this way cannot compete with the incentives that come from marketing. But in the end, what I said, I, I thought the European government, um, they're going to revise the essential requirements next year. I think the current uh, um, essential requirements um, they have this loophole of consumer acceptance. We really have to get rid of these kind of um, business lobby loopholes in, in regulations. So if we really want to get the circular economy uh, going, then I ask all of the business here, let's lobby for strict regulations because that's in the end what will make the difference. Thank you. Uh, Tiago, I'll go to you next. Thanks. Well, um... The EU government is what I would have voted for, I guess, because of um, there's there's something to do about the uh, recycled content, perhaps in materials. And there's also definitely a, a big question for us, as in uh, how are we going to measure recycling in the next couple of years? And those standards should be set by a government, even for an EPR scheme. That's that's something that we need to be able to know what to do. Uh, but having said that, uh, the EPR um, scheme, of course, came out second. Uh, and the next steps that we want to take are to, well, invest more in business development. So we've uh, just started up to, to think more about the future and, and actively get involved in how the chain is organized. And it's in line with what uh, Graham presented, I guess, although it's not that far yet. Uh, we're, making small steps uh, we're thinking about the future and we will uh, set put out an, uh, an agenda what we believe are the most important things to work on in the next couple of years and then also incentivize parties to do so uh, because in the end we're, uh, we, we move money from A to B basically that's what we do um, and we move it from the producer importers to the sorting and recycling infrastructure and so we'll, we'll um, incentivize that structure to uh, achieve the highest recycling targets and also do that at the best cost. That's what we're going to do. Thank you. Um, Arnold, I'd like to, to turn to you. So um, national government comes very low in, in, the, in the poll. Um, is that something that you would see that, uh, that your influence is, uh, is less than, than many of the other stakeholders? And, and where do you see the, the gaps in, in leadership at the moment? Well, I'm glad that um, that people are um, a bit realistic on what um, uh, national governments can do um, on product policies, uh, which is um, uh, a prerogative uh, for the EU. Um, but of course, we can have, um, uh, as other stakeholders, have an um, indirect uh, influence on the on the agenda of the European Commission. Uh, so happy to um, to help with that. Um, uh, and for sure, it um, um, uh, it it would take uh, uh, several steps, and, and 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 I would like to be um, realistic on what uh, regulations can do, um, because uh, as, especially with flexible pa plastic packaging, uh, the challenges are huge, um, very complex, and um, 
if you want to change that that system, uh, regulations it, um, themselves um, are not a change maker. You you have to define together um, uh, new concepts um, and try out. So um, innovation uh, in these sorts of um, uh, of contexts um, only help with um, uh, co collaboration. Uh, along the value chain uh, and together with um, uh, several sorts of um, uh, businesses and of, of course with the help of, uh, of the government and we are uh, happy to do that but um, um, innovations um, uh, should be uh, in place before we can do something on um, uh, on um, uh, on regulations I'm afraid um, so that's why I, I said well producers and importance um, they have to uh, rethink their their models um, uh, fundamentally uh, and come up with new new solutions and that helps us also as governments and the uh, European Commission to um, uh, to create new uh, frameworks um, for uh, for the packaging um, and packaging waste directive. Thank you, Arnold. Um, Dana, um, again, where, where do you see the, uh, the main gaps in in providing the, the necessary pressure to, to drive things forward? Um, do I see gaps? Um, I, I do see an, an immense opportunity with the EPR redefinition because I'm hearing a lot and I totally agree that the EPR, the way it works today, it's kind of outdated and it really needs to um, align to what the ambitions of the circular economy are. Uh, and to the Green Deal overall, uh, because I agree, we, we can't stop only to, to circular economy. Meanwhile, I would like to add to this discussion the importance of the national governments. Uh, it somehow I know it had touched on it, but the, if we look at some examples around Europe where national legislation even anticipated the European new targets or even went further and, and faster with implementing different measures to drive the action. And I think these are beautiful examples which inspire that at national level you can have an impact which is at least as big as that one which will be at the European level. Um, and a lot can happen at, at national level. Um, and the other thing which I want to add is, yes, indeed, um, the, the producer, the brand owners have a lot of power in reality because at the end of the day, they do pay. They are those who put the money on the table for the EPR mostly, if, unless this is being changed dramatically and I don't think so in the near future. So um, brand owners are, um, you know, you hear here and there, do they do enough? And, and I do really have a lot of admiration for the, the concrete examples of actions taken with audacity to set ambitious goals and then, and then put all the teams, align all the teams in the organization to deliver sometimes a mission impossible. So really by, by having the same audacity the brand owners in driving the this redesign of the EPR, I think a lot can be done. Thank you. And also, Dana, um, thinking about, um, you know, much of our audience, I believe, um, represents the, the value chain rather than um, the, the regulatory world. Um, you've got a lot of experience from value chain collaboration from, from CFLEX. Um, how do you see um, collaboration working at this stage and, and um, how can the members of the audience who are uh, representing the, the brand owners and the, the packaging manufacturers and, and further up the chain, how do you think that they as organizations can be impacting positively beyond what we're doing at the moment to, uh, to uh, adapt to uh, design for recycling? Um, when you ask about collaboration, that's something which it's so important and it's happening so much these days that I don't think anybody uh, in this panel or in the audience doubts that the collaboration is in fact a key driver. Um, indeed, in CFLEX we're experiencing the power of collaboration and it's impressive how much we can progress in defining solutions because we have the benefit of having the expertise of everybody around the value chain really in, in debating and in addressing the issues. But I would say that, um, you know, thinking 
the most important um, mindset which will help us today is for each of us to think what can I do and how can I do it faster um, instead of thinking what should the other ones do uh, because we all need to do it we all need to act the time it's now or it has been yesterday and it's our it's in our best interest to make flexible packaging a key contributor to the circular economy because we've seen and experienced for so many years the benefits of the resource efficiency of it and it's possible to be done and i think we what's what's magic these days is that it seems like we all understand in fact the challenges and what it's needed to be done so let's just move to action that's a great uh, <laughs> great thought to, to, to nearly finish on neil so i haven't given you a chance to respond to the poll yet where do you where would you see action as, as dana puts it as the uh, where would your priority be for, for action yeah i think it's very simple we are not facing a national problem or a local problem we are facing a global problem and the companies in the cop all sell their stuff throughout the world the netherlands is only a tiny little country not a big market at all so where they earn money is in other countries is abroad so of course it's in my national interest to point at the european government and i've studied for a while the differences in definitions of recyclability within different organizations like cflex like the ellen mccarter foundation like the national uh, at the national uh, epr system and it doesn't help if you have not even your um, your definitions in order um, and also if you cannot print international uh, logos on packaging to instruct consumers what to do it doesn't help because there's no such thing as a national packaging your, your product will be sold to multiple countries so i think the, the priority is simplify this kind of basic necessities because they bring a lot of stress within the companies who need to change their packaging and i think these are the hygiene part of the solution and i think we can easily start with that and then roll out the technology and then uh, we need to secure for the companies that they know that when they invest which direction they should go and I think it doesn't help if every European country has a different um, approach. I, I think we need to look 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 at least European, and I think we need the help of the European Commission, and we need guidance there. Thanks very much, Niels. Well, we've basically run out of time now, and uh, we've we've brought it in just about on the uh, required time. So thank you very much to uh, our five panelists today. Um, thank you very much for KIDB for, uh, for hosting this really, really interesting set of discussions today. Um, I think we've highlighted some really key crucial areas um, looking at uh, the importance of getting EPR and uh, eco-modulation rights to uh, unlock the investments that's going to deliver the scale of change that we require. Um, we've, we've touched on the need for harmonization um, across this you know, fragmented uh, landscape of, of markets and uh, infrastructures. Um, and we've also touched on the really important questions of uh, collection waste streams and recycling strategies where we need to find sweet spots between scale and quality, um, mechanical and chemical recycling. Um, I think there's also a sense of, of real common purpose um, and that some of the differences that we need to work on now are really nuances and um, rather than uh, conflicts. Um, it's clear that we've, we've still got a lot of work to do and a lot of collaboration that we need to, to continue with. Um, so uh, we'll look forward to following uh, all of your organizations and, and uh, continuing this, this discussion and uh, action over the coming months and years. Um, I've been told that I'm allowed to give a, a little promotional plug, so I'm going to abuse this, um, this opportunity just to mention that speaking of continuing discussions, um, in one week's time on Thursday the 18th of February at the same time, 2 p.m. Amsterdam time, um, I will be hosting another panel discussion focusing on uh, some of these key circular flexibles uh, dilemmas 
um, we'll be looking at what, what are the key uh, challenges and dilemmas on, on this uh, agenda for 2021. We'll have um, Graham Holder from CFLEX back for more, um, Felix Bizzati of Mars, and some other value chain stakeholders from the CFLEX consortium. Um, and we'll be building on some of the, the themes that we've discussed today. You're very welcome to, to join us for that. Uh, and you can register via the website packagingsummit.earth forward slash join, or you can find the details on the Packaging Europe LinkedIn page. Um, Chris also mentioned at the start the Sustainability Awards competition. Um, this is something that we uh, host and uh, organize, and that is now open for submissions. You can again find that via Packaging Europe. Um, we warmly invite you to, uh, if you're in the business of, of uh, sustainable innovation, to, to engage with that competition because we're trying to shine a spotlight on all, all the most important uh, advances in technology uh, for the circular economy and, and sustainability more broadly around the world. Um, thank you very much again to everyone for taking part. Um, the video of today's session will be made available um, in the coming days on the KIDV website. Uh, as we mentioned before, you can also uh, submit any of your questions to KIDV if we didn't manage to, uh, to address them today. Um, I'd now like to uh, say thanks again and to hand over to Neil Spanmala for a final word. Thank you very much, Tim, uh, for making everyone feel comfortable in guiding us through the webinar in such a professional way. I also recommend that all of you visit the webinar you mentioned. I think it's helping. I, we see it in the uh, re responses as well. We need this type of discussion. Um, we need to train our thoughts. Uh, further thanks to the presenters and panelists for the sharp insights and open dialogue. Graham, Dominica, Tor, Dana, Chaco, Arnaud, Yelmer. Uh, this community was not possible within the participating companies and stakeholders. So thank you very much for that. I would also like to thank Lilian and Maatje and Ninke for their excellent preparations for the event. Unfortunately, Mark, Maatje was not able to come uh, to be present today. Um, but and they were of course expertly assisted by the technology uh, by Marta from AFEC. Uh, also on behalf of our managing director Chris and project leader Gijs, I would like to thank all of you, all visitors. We are honored uh, you have attended in such large numbers. I will like to take the opportunity to motivate you not to wait with activities that should lead to the circular economy. We cannot wait. Because one thing is clear, companies cannot sit still and wait until every condition is perfect. We need all of you to get uh, the transition moving and look at the big picture. Please look for no regret steps. In particular, when it comes to the use of polyolefin-based flexible packaging materials like PE and PP and mixed polyolefins. What can you do to minimize material uses? and adapt your packaging process or packaging usage to make it at least suitable for recycling um, and question um, how you can innovate, collaborate and commit to solving the bigger dilemmas. So thanks and all. And I would like to draw your attention to the mail that you will receive after this event. In it, you will find the information map uh, Gijs already mentioned. With an, uh, with an overview of the most important dilemmas we face in this community of practice. Please do not hesitate to build on this and please do not hesitate to inform us with your insights and with your knowledge. Thank you very much.